any feature we could ever add to JSON that's more valuable than that. Most standards are issued in a half-baked way. They say, well, we couldn't have figured everything out yet, and we probably got stuff wrong, but we'll fix it in, in 1.1 or 1.2 or 2.0. JSON says, no, this is it. This is all it's ever going to be. It may be replaced by something better someday, but it's never going to break, which is nice. And then JSON also embraces minimalism, and the principle that the less we need to agree on, the easier it is to interoperate. We see a lot of standards where the standards committee couldn't agree if we're going to do A or B, and so they say, let's do A and B. And that makes the standard twice as complex as it needs to be. Or they might decide, we can't decide between A and B, so we'll do C, the mutually disagreeable compromise, which doesn't serve anybody. And there are lots of examples of that as well. JSON's just this one simple thing that works, and that's all it is. There are some bad practices in JSON, and usually I just ignore these because I'm not the JSON police. It's not my business to go around telling people if they're using it well or not. Turns out most people are using it really well, um, but I'm not going to go out of my way to tell somebody that they're not because I get paid the same either way, so there's no reason for me to do it. Also, I, I found that if you identify a practice as being particularly bad, there are coders out there who will go, I'm going to so do that, um, and I don't want to encourage the kids to, to be doing bad things. But there are some bad practices which are so bad, and I think even the kids aren't going to want to do these. So let me show you a couple of them. In XML, there was an attribute element confusion. You could represent a piece of data as an attribute of a tag, or you could do it as the child element of a tag, as another tag. And it wasn't clear which one should you use. And so in the XML community had a lot of confusion about that. You saw people making up rules that you should do it this way in these cases and that way in those cases. And everybody had a different set of rules. And sometimes the justification for one rule actually seemed to be arguing for the other. Anytime you've got a situation where there are two ways of doing things and not a clear reason for why you should prefer one over the other, about half the community will pick one and half will pick the other, and then they'll argue about it endlessly. It's like spaces and tabs. And attributes and elements in XML was like that. Fortunately, JSON does not have that confusion because it's just simple data structures and data structures. It's clear, you know, if it's a sequence, it's an array. If it's associative values, it's an object, and that's it. It's really simple. But sometimes you'll see someone putting at signs in the names of their properties. And it's because they're still thinking in XML. And they're preserving that confusion in the new stuff that they're writing in, in a more modern system. So if you see somebody putting at signs, again, Jason doesn't care. And actually, I don't care either. But it means that they are fundamentally confused about what they're doing. And you probably want to send them to a re-education camp. An even worse case is this one. A common pattern in XML was you've got a tag, and inside you've got a bunch of little subordinate tags, and each one contains name properties and value properties. And on the left, you see, um, no, on, on the right, you'll see that kind of thinking transformed into JSON. And JSON can do that. Uh, JSON is very flexible. It, you can have XML formatted stuff in JSON, and it actually cleans it up. It removes a lot of the extraneous noise. But there's a better way to write it, and that's just as an object containing properties that have those values. So if, if you do it correctly, then the program that consumes it might be able to say, just give me data.height, and it gets the height. Doing it the XML way, it means you have to do a query on that array. You have to look at each element and ask, are you an object that contains a name property whose value 
is the name of the property that I'm trying to get. And if so, then return the value of the value attribute or value property, which is, it's just a lot more complicated and much more likely to produce errors. So if you see somebody doing this, then also you need to send them to a re-education camp. So, um, so I created json.org and, and everything took off and was really nice. And I decided that I should put a logo on the page because no one's gonna believe it's a standard if it doesn't have a logo. So I made a logo and that's the logo right there. And I modeled it after an optical illusion called the impossible torus, which is closely related to another illusion called the ambihelical hex nut. So I took the impossible torus and I kind of rotated it and made it circular and gave it some dramatic shading and I came up with that. And I thought, that looks pretty good. I think that's a nice looking logo. And I've done some different treatments to it over the years. One is uh, this one in half tones that I made for a business card. So um, this is the card. It's got the JSON logo on it. And on the back is the data standard. The JSON standard is so simple that it fits on the back of a business card, which I think is not all standards should be able to do that, but this one does, and I think that's a really nice property. If you'd like one of these, come see me after the talk, and I'd be happy to give you one. It's just a business card. So um, here's another one. I made. I was inspired by Shepard Ferry's Obama poster. I call this data interchange we can believe in. Um, since then, I've noticed that a lot of other people are also making logos which look a lot like the JSON logo, and in some cases it looks identical, which is okay because I did not secure intellectual protection on any of the JSON stuff, so the standard is not copyrighted, the uh, name of the standard and the logo are not trademarked, which I did because I wanted to make them as available and unencumbered as possible. And I was kind of wondering, why is it that all these other logos are kind of showing up that look the same? And I think it may be similar to how Jason kind of was independently discovered by a lot of people, that it was something that was just kind of naturally in the environment, and eventually it was going to surface and take over. So looking back into time, where did the idea for this logo came from? The earliest form of this I've been able to find is in Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. So my parents took me to see this at a drive-in with my little brother when I was four. And this is really not a movie you want to take kids to. It's about uh, obsession and creepiness, and it's just it kind of reflected Hitchcock's own obsessions and creepiness. But the title sequence is one of the best title sequences in the history of cinema. It was designed by Saul Bass, who's a brilliant designer. And in it, he, um, he starts with a woman's face and eventually uh, pushes into her eye. And this thing appears in her eye, and then she disappears, and we're kind of floating into this void with this wonderful Bernard Herrmann music behind it, and it's just strange and alien and creepy and cold and wonderful. And it's got this shape in it, which must have burned itself into my four-year-old mind. This was by far the most interesting part of the movie. Uh, the, the shapes here were designed by um, John Whitney, maybe the first computer artist, using what we would now call an analog computer. He repurposed a, a uh, war surplus targeting site, gun site, and fitted it with a camera and could make these shapes. And so in this title sequence, we're kind of flowing through these shapes, sort of anticipating the uh, Stargate sequence in 2001, except much more slow, and, and it's amazing. It's the first use of computer graphics of any kind in a major motion picture, wonderful stuff. And this shape keeps recurring through that voyage through this woman's 
brain or, or whatever is going on. And I, I think this is where it came from. I think this was my inspiration for the JSON logo. Um, I didn't know that when I made the JSON logo, but you know, a couple years ago, I happened to, to see Vertigo again, and it was like, oh, God, you know, that's where it came from. Yeah, obviously. Um, now, there may be earlier precedents like this. Um, there, spiral galaxies actually have this shape. So it may be that the great maker has been doing this for much longer, maybe. But anyway, it, it's, it's great. So yeah, that, that's the JSON logo. So I, um, there's something that I'm, I'm working on currently, which wants to solve one of the biggest problems we still have in programming and that is the IEEE 754 floating point standard, which is in all of our languages today. And there's a problem with it. So when you type 0.1 into your program, what you get is that yellow number. You think you're getting 1.1, and if you ask it to print out the thing, it will lie to you and tell you, yeah, boss, it's, it's 0.1, but it's not. It's this much larger number, which is very close to 0.1, but it's not exactly equal to 0.1. And as a consequence, 0.1 plus 0.2 is not equal to 0.3, which I think is bizarre. We shouldn't, it's the 21st century. We are in the future. We should be able to rub three dimes together and get the right answer, and we can't. So I, I think this is a huge deficiency, a huge deficiency in programming that how can, if you're dealing with, like, money, people have a reasonable expectation that when you're adding up their money, you're going to get the right answer. And we're not guaranteed to get the right answer in our current number system. It made sense for Fortran back in the 50s, but it's not the way we should be doing things today. We should have moved past this. So what I'm recommending is that we move to a decimal floating point system. So this is my proposal. You can read about it at deck64.com where we have a 64-bit word, which we divide into a 56-bit coefficient and an 8-bit exponent, so that the value of a number is that coefficient times 10 to the exponent. So that's the whole encoding of it. It's really simple. Um, in a software implementation, we can add two integers in five cycles, or in five instructions, which Five sounds like a lot, except that you also get NAND protection and overflow protection. So the terrible things that happen to ints when they flow over do not happen on this format, which is really valuable. And it, in a hardware implementation, we should be able to add, ints, or add integers in one cycle, which eliminates the excuse for why we need ints. We can get rid of ints and the errors that come from int to float and back conversion, we can do everything in this one format. So my goal is eventually, this will be the last, or this will be the one number type in all future programming languages. So that means I have to convince everybody in the world we're gonna stop doing binary floating point and we'll start doing this again. And I have some confidence that I can do that because I did it with JSON, you know, maybe I, maybe I can do it one more time. And it turns out, this time, I don't have to convince everybody in the world. I only have to convince one person. And that's the, the, the genius, the man or the woman who designs the next programming language. If I can convince that person that they should have in their language a single number type which works in a way that works for humans, that, for example, if you have a big number and you run out of significance, what should be in the extra digit places, they should be zeros, right? In this format, there are zeros. It, it works the way we think big numbers should work. So this is the next thing, I, I hope. So uh, that's the end of the talk. I have, hope you have a great conference. Everybody keep calm and Jason on. Thank you very much. <laughs>